introduction to the Apocrypha Gospels. What I'd like to do is start out by just recapping it. Recap what we talked about last week. Uh, we discussed the meaning of the word Apocrypha. And we saw that the word literally means hidden or secret. And what I did was I, I put in red here that middle of the word we have crypt. Understanding crypt is something that's hidden away like in a church basement or in a cave or something. So it, the meaning is right there. However, the Apocrypha as being secret took on other meanings. And we saw in the Old Testament that the Apocrypha had to do with a uh, series of books that were written in between, in the testamental period, between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. And those works... Um, some people view them as false works. So the, mean, uh, the meaning of the word apocrypha took on a meaning of false, fake, spurious, as it's known as. But um, for the Old Testament, among the Jewish people, the works were considered secret. The reason for it was they did not consider them inspired works. That is part of the canon of their, of their Bible. But they did say these works have value. And some Jewish communities in, uh, included those apocryphal works in their Bible. And, for example, the, the Jews outside of Jerusalem in the diaspora in places like Alexandria, Egypt, um, in Antioch and Tarsus, where St. Paul was from, they were all, in those Jewish communities, they were all Greek-speaking Jews. So they, they produced in Alexandria, about 300 years before Christ, a Greek version of the Bible, which we call a Septuagint also known as the Greek, the Greek Bible, the Greek Old Testament. And those works are included. And it's, it just happens to be that the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church use that version of the, um, uh, of the Old Testament. So sometimes our Protestant brethren say, oh, what are these books? Are they fake books and all? But the meaning is not fake there. It's just that they're not canonical, but they are writings that have a lot of value. And we consider them canonical. Derutero canonical, second canon. All right, so we separated the Old Testament Apocrypha from the New Testament. I'm going to come on this side because I know I have to stay in the range of the camera. Okay. And uh, we discussed Gnosticism. The reason we discussed Gnosticism was because the majority of these, old, of these uh, Apocrypha Gospels in the New Testament were produced by the Gnostics. And we discussed what Gnosticism was, right? It is kind of a, um, a religion that has its own cosmology. And sometimes, and it has in the past, existed outside of Christianity. And uh, when Christ came, they just incorporated Christ into that uh, cosmology, that, uh, that order of their um, understanding of the world that they, uh, they believe in. And we'll look at that a little closer. We also talked about the discovery of the ancient writings. We knew about all these apocrypha gospels from the early church fathers, especially uh, uh, St. Irenaeus wrote about them, uh, also uh, Hippolytus. And we're going to see there's another one we'll talk about today, Epiphanes, also a, a saint and early church father. They all wrote about heresies, and they considered these heretical works. So these are fake. Now... This is where the word apocrypha takes on the meaning of fake or false in the New Testament. All right. So we found out that they found some at a place in uh, Egypt, Oxyrhynchus. They found uh, the Greek text, uh, text of the Gospel of Thomas, just three uh, manuscripts, uh, just three uh, uh, fragments is the word I wanted. Okay. And at Nag Hammadi, though, in 1945, they found that just a ton of these uh, these works. They found all these Gnostic writings. When they say works of, that are found at Nag Hammadi, it, it's synonymous with Gnosticism because they believed that these works were hidden, buried there at this site after St. Um, Athanasius in 367 wrote what they call the Festal Letter. That's a letter that each year the uh, patriarch in Alexandria, Virginia would um, come out with this is the day that we're going to celebrate Easter based on the, um, 
observatory in Alexandria, Virginia, which they said was the best in the ancient world, that they could predict when the new moons were coming uh, more precisely, and that would determine the date of Easter. That's how the Jews determined the, the Passover, right? In Rome, they would set a fixed date, but that's outside our scope of this conversation. Uh, so, when they heard, uh, in that letter, Athanasius also wrote down a list. It's the first list of the 27 books that make up the New Testament. There's 27 books in the New Testament. That's Gospels, Epistles, Acts of the Apostles, and uh, the, the Apocalypse. All of the separate epistles add up to 27 books. The Catholics, Orthodox, Protestants, Evangelicals, all the majority of the kind of mainstream Christianity follows that 27 books. St. Athanasius gave us the first list. Right away, the people, in, uh, especially in Egypt, where these Gnostic sects, sects dominated, buried their things, because there was going to be persecution. As a matter of fact, we couldn't, uh, since the days of Irenaeus, that's about uh, just before, of course, um, uh, Athanasius, we, uh, uh, till, our, till the present time, we had no copies of these books we knew them from the church fathers. Now we had the copies. We found the hidden ones. All right. So, uh, so we looked at the Gospel of Thomas, which uh, it's the, it's, it says Didymus Judas Thomas. Didymus means twin, and in, in Greek, and Thomas is twin in uh, in Aramaic. So it's actually it's twin. Uh, uh, we're a, a twin Judas twin, if you will look at it that way. They emphasize twin because some say he was a brother of Christ. I don't know if they believe it was his twin or what. There's a, a lot of that we're, go, we're going to see uh, today. Why that um, they believe that uh, Christ had brothers. All right, so then um, we saw how difficult it was to understand the passages in the gospel. When we read some of them, they seemed to be, they didn't make sense. But when we compare them to the teachings of the Gnostics, we saw there that it made sense if you followed their, their beliefs. And uh, let's just see here. Uh, I want to go back and just uh, quickly review that about the Gnostics, okay? This here, the blue circle, was the spiritual world. And it says the one. The one is the monad, the one God. That's the supreme God. And he has emanations. Emanations is light, wisdom, and also eons. Now, two eons that are famous is Sophia, who's up there, which is wisdom. And also, Christ was an eon, an emanation of the, of the God, right? Along came a demiurge. The demiurge is from, demiurge is from the Greek word craftsman, craftsman uh, or um, um, a builder. Because why? The Demiurge built and created the physical world and the physical universe. That's where that name comes in. Who is this Demiurge? According to the Gnostic Christians, this is the God of the Old Testament. Genesis created the universe. See? And man, who was a spirit, an emanation, men are also emanations of the monad, right? was captured in that creation. In other words, a physical body was put on him in creation. And we see that in, in Genesis. So they accept the Bible as it's written, but only they put a different meaning to it. And the whole idea is for, these, for us humans to find a way to get back into that spiritual world. That is, it's a religion of salvation. That's when we use the word salvation, that Christ came to save us. It's exactly what they say. That's right, Christ came to save us. He's an eon, and he told us what we have to do. And what, what a person needs to be saved is to have knowledge. And the word for knowledge in Greece is gnosis. And the knowledge isn't general knowledge, it's self-knowledge. When you realize who you are, that you're part of this cosmology, that you're part, an emanation of the, of the monad, and you have to work your way back through those rings after you die to get back to salvation. That's the whole concept. And that's the meaning they put on the same gospel. So you had the, you had the Orthodox Christians, and by that I mean the Christians who... Uh, uh, follow pretty much the teachings we do today, and you have the Gnostics attending the same churches, but putting a different meaning to the Gospels. So they actually produce some of their own Gospels also. That's what we call 
the Gnostic Gospels, and that was the Gospel of Thomas. Okay, now there's other Gospels, that's what we're going to talk about today. There's, there's many different types of Gospels based on who produced them. And we're going to look at today at Jewish Christian Gospels and just talk about it because none of them are extant. We don't have any copies of the Jewish Christian Bible, but we have some, uh, we know about them from the writings, especially from uh, Epiphanes. Now, we'll go into that in a second. And then there's harmonized Gospels. I mentioned something about that in the introduction yesterday, how uh, Tatian, for example, took uh, three of the Gospels, all but John, and harmonized them. Now, that was uh, acceptable to the Syrian church, but the Orthodox and the Catholic church has said no go because somebody by the name of Tatian decided what he's going to put in and what he's not going to put in. You see? But what he put in certainly is from the... Uh, uh, the canonical Gospels. So that part's true, but still, he's altering things. So he could leave out something that's maybe important. And uh, there's what I call derivatives. I haven't seen that term in the literature, but uh, a lot of these Gospels are derived from canonical Gospels. So they're derivative. That's why I put the name there. So the lost Gospels or false Gospels. Okay. So do, uh, we're going to look at Jewish Christian Gospels, harmonized uh, derivatives. That's other than the Gnostics. Okay. Now, there were three main Jewish communities that produced scriptures. The Nazarenes, the Ebionites, and the Hebrews. We know that from the literature, from St. Irenaeus, but especially from Epiphanes. So the Jewish Christians in the early church believed that the people of God, to be, to be belong to the people of God, one needed to be Jewish. As a result, they insisted on keeping the Sabbath, Sabbath keeping uh, the kosher laws when it comes to eating, and also uh, that males would be uh, circumcised. And we know from the Acts of the Apostles that this conflict that went on in the early church. So this, this is bearing out one thing good about the Apocryphal Gospels. They have a value because whether they're false gospels or true gospels, they're still history. They're written in a context, and we can study the context and learn things. Right? We can learn about Gnostics, the debates going on in the church, but we also learn about things like uh, there was a resistance among the early Jews, Jews who converted to Christianity, heard Peter talking right, right on a Pentecost Sunday and converted, still believed they, that Christ came for the Jews, because Christ did come for the Jews initially, right? He came for the Jews to convert them, and uh, he was one of them. He was the promised Messiah, and they believed it. He was fulfilling the prophets. We have to keep the Jewish law. Okay. As a matter of fact, this is an interesting, uh, well, not this, uh, uh, just, we'll hold that for, for a moment. Okay. So, even we know that when Peter went up to Jew, uh, Jerusalem after he converted Cornelius. Cornelius was a Roman centurion who was inspired to call Peter to come to him and explain the Christian faith. He was a righteous kind of uh, uh, Roman centurion. And he may even be the one who uh, said, Lord, you know, uh, I'm unworthy. You should come under my roof. What well, could possibly be it? I don't, I don't know that for a fact. But he was a centurion who was um, a righteous man like the centurion we know from the, uh, from the Gospels. And he asked Peter to come. Peter came and told him, and he said, then baptize me. When he was baptized, him and his family and his household, his servants, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began speaking in tongues. So when Peter came back to Jerusalem, and he told the Jewish Christians there, they said, uh, uh, why did you go to the uncircumcised men and why did you eat with them? And Peter explained everything and they accepted it. So some Jews would accept it, you see, and some Jews would not. The Jews that wrote these Gospels were the ones who hold, held on and weren't uh, about to accept the Gentiles, you see. Okay. So none of the Christian Gospels, none of these Jewish cross, uh, Gospels are extant. Um, they're known so only through Epiphanes. And you can find these writings, you see, of people like Epiphanes. Here's a book here. Uh, it's called, his work is called The Panarium of, of Epiphanes of Salamis. He was the bishop there, became the bishop of Cyprus also. 
They believe he was born in Jerusalem. Now, so he probably was originally a Jew. There he is. Epiphanes of Salamis, 315 to 403. So from the 4th into the early uh, 5th century. Okay. Now, we're going to look at the Gospel of the Ebionites. I found this emblem. Uh, I'm not sure if it was something that was made up today or if it was actually what the, uh, uh, the Ebionites used, the Jews, the Star of David and the cross. But it does signify for us Jewish Christianity, I think. All right. By the way, the Ebionites were Hellenized Jews. What it means is they were Greek-speaking Jews. Uh, we know from the Gospels that uh, when the Jews came into uh, uh, the Jewish festivities like Feast of the Passover or the, or the Jewish Feast of Pentecost, they would, uh, the Jews would come from all around outside of uh, Jerusalem. They come from Egypt and from, uh, even from Rome. Uh, we know that was the center. So a lot of Hellenized Jews come up. And the Hellenized Jews are also found in the Acts of the Apostles, that they had conflicts with the, um, with the Jerusalem Jews who spoke Aramaic at the time, and he spoke Greek, about the, the distribution uh, among the Christian Hellenized Jews now, among the distribution of, um, of food stuff, among, uh, they were saying, the, the Jews uh, in, uh, for Jerusalem were favoring themselves and not giving a share to our widows and, and orphans, and that had to be resolved in the early, early church. So uh, they believe, though, this is a group who never really embraced uh, what uh, Peter and Paul then uh, decided and the early apostles to accept the Gentiles. So they believed that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah from the Jewish God to the Jewish people in fulfillment of the Jewish scriptures. Okay. So the gospel of the Ebionites, it only survives in the writings of Epiphanes. And his writings include his own comments. So when we read these, there's only seven verses it's the only thing that survives. It's the only thing we know about it. We'll just look at them in a moment. But the gospel is known only through these quotations uh, from this work called the panarium. And the panarium is from the Greek word. It means bread. So it means either bread basket or um, sometimes a medicine chest. Probably in ancient Greece they carried the medicine in a, in a bread basket uh, perhaps because uh, most of the medicines were made from uh, from herbs and things like that. Okay. Okay. So here's uh, here's uh, how it starts out. And by the way, um, I I've forgot to mention that all of the Jewish uh, of the Jewish scriptures here from the Jewish Christians are all derivatives of the Gospel of Matthew. Now let me just take a word on the Gospel of Matthew. We know, I'm sure that most of you know if you're not sure about this, out of the four Gospels, three are written in Greek and one is written as Aramaic. If you're studying the scriptures in depth, you study about who wrote them, where, when, and what, who was their audience. In other words, who were they writing to? Everyone writing down has an audience in his mind. He's writing to certain people. So we know that um, Mark, Luke, and John wrote in Greek. So we know that uh, looking at their scriptures, we see that they are, are pretty universal in their audience, but they are writing for, for the Gentiles because they're writing in Greek. But, but uh, Matthew wrote in Aramaic. And not only is it the language, but it's the context of Matthew's gospel. What he focuses on, you see, is specifically for the Jews. Now here's what's, what we have to realize, and sometimes we don't uh, put this in context. Matthew wrote his gospel after, uh, scholars tell us this, that this gospel was written about between 80 and uh, 90 A.D., Right, so that would be what? 80 would be, uh, uh, if Christ died at 33, um, 80 would be 50 years after Christ, right? If, after his death, roughly. But it is after the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem. And when we think of the Temple of Jerusalem when it was destroyed, Judaism wasn't the same anymore because 
the Jewish religion was built around the temple. That is why I had just mentioned that people from uh, the Jews from all around the known world would come into Jerusalem for the three big holidays, Passover, Pentecost, and unleavened bread. There were three big holidays that the Jews all came. They came from all over. Also around the pri priestly class. And a priestly class means sacrifice. Right? We have to sacrifice. That's what a priest does. We have priests in our church because we have the sacrifice of the mass. Right? But in the old days, they sacrificed animals. And that was what the temple was about. When the temple was destroyed, uh, Judaism was in limbo. Right? Why did they need the priestly class? There was no more temple. Nobody was going to come then to Jerusalem anymore. This is when Matthew made his appeal to the Jews. What he was trying to tell them was the Gospels or, or the life of Christ is the fulfillment of the prophets and the law. It's over. This is who you have to follow. That's why his Gospel was targeted to the Jews. It was to the Jews who were in limbo thinking, where do we go from here? At about 100 or 90 something AD, they met, the rabbis met in uh, Caesarea, I believe, on the coast, and they started developing what they call rabbinical Judaism. And they wrote what they call the Mishnah, the different traditions. And this tradition came down from the Pharisees, and there's no priestly class. Today we know they don't have priests, and they don't have temples, and they don't do sacrifices. But Matthew was making an appeal at that time. So these uh, Jews, uh, these Jewish groups, right, were borrowing from him. So here has this gospel starts, the gospel of the Ebionites that we know from Ep Epiphanes as he quotes it. There appeared a certain man named Jesus of about 30 years of age who chose us, meaning the Jews. And when he came to Capernaum, he entered the house of Simon, whose name is Peter, and opened his mouth and said, as I pass the lake Tiberias, which is the Sea of Galilee, right? So he's up in Galilee. <coughs> I chose John and James, the sons of Zebedee, Simon and Andrew and Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot and Judas the Iscariot, and you, Matthew, because this is taken from Matthew, say, I called you uh, 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 who sat as a, a receipt of customs, and you followed me. You, therefore... Uh, I will be the 12th. Uh, believe it or not, I checked this uh, writing, and it's, uh, it's the way it's translated. It's not typos that I wrote here. I will be 12 apostles for testimony unto Israel. Okay. So you can see that it might not be word for word, but it's taken from, from Matthew. Okay. Okay. This is from Epiphanes, his chapter 30. By the way, the Panarium is a book of heresies according to um, Epiphanes, from Adam right down to that time. Anything that was uh, heretical, in other words, teachings that weren't accepted uh, in Judaism and in early Christianity. Okay. So the Ebionites, by the way, vegetarians. So we have to see, they have to alter the gospel sometimes, according to Epiphanes, uh, to meet their um, uh, justification to be uh, vegetarians. They said, it came to pass that John was baptizing, and they went out uh, uh, to him. The Pharisees were baptized in all of Jerusalem. That sounds familiar. I think we had something in today's gospel from Mark, and we know that Matthew borrowed from Mark too, so that uh, it sounds uh, uh, familiar. And John had a garment of camel hair. This was in today's gospel. Camel hair and leather girt about his loins and his... And his food, as it is said, was wild honey. The taste of, of it says, if, uh, which was that of manna as a cake dipped in oil. Now I put Epiphanes' comments in italics. Right? It's not in the Panarium. You have to know that this is being said by uh, Epiphanes. He said, thus they were resolved to pervert the truth into a lie and put cake in the place of locusts. <laughs> Because they're vegetarian, they can't eat locusts. <laughs> I mean, we, we don't see it as a, such a big change as perhaps uh, Epiphanes did. But they did change it, you see. And, uh, oh, let's see. Uh, and, and then he continues. This is still quoting Epiphanes. He says, but they abandon the proper sequence of words and pervert the saying, as is plain to all from the readings attached 
and have let the disciples say. Now it's quoting the gospel there of the Ebionites. Where will you uh, have us prepare the Passover? And, uh, and him to answer that. Do I desire with desire, and I checked the wording on this, do I desire with desire, that's exactly what it says, I, I checked different sources. At this Passover to eat flesh with you? In other words, Christ is saying, oh, you, wanna, you think I'm going to eat the lamb, right? I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> See? So they pervert it, is what Epi, Epi, Epiphanes is saying. In other words, he's criticizing it. Okay. So, then, uh, and then he goes on and he says, uh, they say also, uh, because the Jews said Christ is the Messiah, but they never accepted that he was divine. They never accepted the Trinity. So Epiphanes comments, they say that Christ was not begotten of God the Father, but created as one of the archangels. That he rules over the angels and all the creatures of the Almighty, and that he came and declared as their gospel, which is called the gospel according to Matthew, a gospel according to the Hebrews. That's what um, Epiphanes says. And then to quote these scriptures again, their scriptures, I have come to do away with sacrifices. If you cease not sacrificing, the wrath of God will not cease from you. You could take it, they said that because of uh, their vegetarians. But remember this, the temple was destroyed at this time. And they were wondering, do we rebuild the temple? Do we go back to the Judaism as it was in the past? Or do we move on? And even the Ebonites are saying, oh, we move on. Because God is telling us in this, their scriptures that not to make fa uh, sacrifices. Okay, we're going to move now to the infancy gospels. We can't really get into the, to the Jewish Christian scriptures because none of them exist. They only exist in the Panarium with um, uh, Epiphanes and his comments about them. And they sound kind of just sometimes petty comments about honey and locusts is not... A big deal, but it does make a point. Okay. Now, the infancy gospels. There are three infancy gospels that are considered apocrypha. And we're going to study them. Two of them are, are considered folklores. Oops. The pre-evangelium of James is considered folklore, oral tradition that come down about the infant Christ or the child Christ, and also the infancy gospel. But the infancy gospel of Thomas, not to be confused with the gospel of Thomas. The gospel of Thomas purportedly was written by the apostle Thomas, Didymus Thomas, right? But this Thomas is introduced as Thomas the Israelite. But scholars say he wasn't an Israelite because he doesn't, he writes about Judaism and it's obviously he doesn't know about them from the way in the manner he wrote. So whoever he is, we don't know. But it is considered the infancy gospel of Thomas. And they say it's Gnostic. One reason, because it's found at Nag Hammadi. But it would probably have to be what they call proto-Gnostic, early Gnostic, because it's not fully developed. And you have to kind of pick at it to try to say, is this because the Gnostic said it? It is the gospel. Uh, we're going to look at two of these gospels now. Uh, the first two. The gospel of Thomas and the proto-evangelium of James. The gospel of Thomas is, and I'll tell you right now, it's scandalous and it's shocking if, if you haven't read it before. Okay, We're going to have to, uh, as we go on, do a little reading because I, I can't write it down, I'll just read it out uh, rather than just putting it up on the screen, just to get an idea about it. Okay, so the Infancy Gospel of Thomas, one of the most disturbing apocryphal writings. You see, there's a lot of diagrams you can find on top uh, uh, on, online, and you see, this is the Christ child here, and somebody falling from that uh, building. We're going to read about that in a minute. So all infancy gospels are derived from oral tradition and they're commonly called folkloristic. According to the scholars, the infancy gospel of Thomas is from the Gnostic set. Well, that we did cover. All right, the modern day Christian gospel is shocking and scandalous. All right, I'm not going to repeat all. And sometimes I get ahead of myself. <laughs> okay, selections from the infancy gospel of Thomas.
I can read this of it. Maybe um, I'm going to come up here. I can I can read better. Okay, I, we can leave the lights out then, and I can leave that on the board. Okay, let's read what it says. We, by the way, this is pretty much a complete gospel. You can find it online. You can read it. You can read it, the whole gospel probably in 20 minutes through a half an hour. The Infancy Gospel of Thomas. Uh, and I, I can't cover it all, but um, we'll talk about what scholars think they're trying to prove here, what they're trying to say with these, these shocking things. Okay, so now, bear with me. Now a certain teacher, Zacchaeus, by name, was standing there. All right, so I'm starting in the middle here. Okay? He's standing there and he heard, he heard all Jesus was saying these things to his father and marveled greatly that um, being a child, he had such, such things. And after a few days, <clears throat> he came to Joseph and said to him, you have a clever child and he has an understanding. Come. Hand them over to me that I may uh, uh, learn letters, that he may learn letters, and I may teach him with the letters of all knowledge and to salute all the older people and honor them as grandfathers and uh, fathers and to love those his own age. It's because the Jesus here wasn't a really a good boy. He was killing some of his uh, uh, other children. Uh, so I'm just going to skip down here. Now when Zacchaeus, this is the teacher, uh, heard so much uh, allegorical description of the first letter, that was by Jesus, being expounded, he was uh, perplexed at such a reply and at such teachings and said to those who were present, Woe to me! I am forced into a quandary. Wretched that I am that I have brought shame to myself in uh, drawing uh, myself to this child. In other words, Jesus humiliated the teacher. The teacher gave him the alphabet from Alpha to Omega, <laughs> and Jesus came out and said, explain the Omega to me. And then he, the teacher didn't know what he meant, and Jesus gets into detail in explaining the letter, and it's how it's created, and what it's mean. And the teacher was terribly humiliated and embarrassed. And that's the third teacher that Jesus put down, the child, in this, in, in this gospel. So I'm going to skip ahead because we see that as Jesus grows old, it's really the ages they mention in the gospel are from 5 to 12. So if I just pick up here, it says, Now, after some days, Jesus was playing in the upper story of a building. And one of the children who was playing with him fell down from the house and died. And when the other children saw this, they fled. And Jesus remained alone. And the parents of him that was dead came and accused him of having thrown him down. And Jesus replied, I did not throw him down. But they continued to revile him. And then Jesus leaped down from the roof and stood by the body of the child and cried out in a loud voice, Zenon, that was his name. Arise and tell, tell me, did I throw you down? And he arose at once and said, no, Lord, you did not throw me down, but raise me up. And when they saw it, they were amazed. And the parents of the child glorified God by the miracle that had happened and worshipped Jesus. So Jesus now is doing something good for a change. He's not killing a child. But <clears throat> here's another one now. And after these things in the neighborhood of Joseph, um, a little sick child died and his mother wept bitterly. And Jesus heard heard uh, the great mourning and tumult arose and he ran quietly and finding the dead child he touched his breast and said I say to you do not uh, do not die but live be with your mother and immediately it looked up and laughed and he said to the woman take him and give him some milk and remember me and when the people were standing and they saw this um, Marvel and said, truly the child is either a god or an angel of God, for every word out of his mouth is an accomplished deed. And Jesus departed from there and played with the children. Now that word, accomplished deed, is important because Jesus, a lot of times when children died, it was because he said something to them. Just like a child 
today might say, oh, you know, like drop dead, right? And not really meaning it, but as, just as an expression. Well, if Jesus said that, the person would drop dead, you see? And uh, according to these gospels, uh, this particular gospel of Thomas. So what, the, well, let me just give a, another uh, couple excerpts here, and then we'll talk a little about what we think is going on here. So, um, and when he was, um, now I'm going to go down, let's see. All right, let, let me just uh, 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 bring it to the end of this gospel. The end of this gospel borrows from Luke. Right? He's, he's, most of this is taken from Matthew, but this is uh, from Luke. And this is the finding of Jesus in the temple when he's 12 years old. And they stay pretty close to it. He says, and when he was 12 years old, the parents, according to custom, went to Jerusalem uh, to the feast of Passover with their company. And after the Passover, they returned to their house. And while they were returning, the child went back to Jerusalem. But his parents supposed that he was in the company. And when they had gone a day's journey, they sought him among their, their kinfolk, and they did not find him. And they were troubled, and returned to the city seeking him. And after the third day, they found him in the temple among the teachers, listening to the law and asking their, their questions. And all paid attention to him and marveled how the child uh, went on, and the elders and the teachers. So it pretty much follows it. So what these, this gospel shows is the development of the child, of the Christ child. And this is what they think now. Let me... Uh, See what I put down here on how this, um, how the scholars believe it is. Oh, I had some more here. Okay, here's this, there's two theories here. One is that uh, Jesus doesn't realize the full extent of his powers as a child. In other words, he's like any other child, uh, any human child, that is. But he learns and he matures. He begins to exercise his divine powers in a responsible way. And it was meant to demonstrate a human Jesus, also divine, but as a child, there was a learning curve. But what I think they're trying to do is, is since they're Gnostics, is saying that this is someone special. It was an eon from God sent down for a message. He has all this power. But another school of scholars believe that... Uh, and many of them were uh, of the converts in that they were Gentiles. So they grew up in the Greek world. The Gentiles, the first converts, mostly were in the Greek world. And in the Greek world, they understood the Greek mythologies. They knew Homer and the Iliads, and they knew the stories of the gods. And as the gods as children, they did wonderful and powerful deeds. And that built up their reputation as being gods. So they thought, this is what these scholars think, that they were trying to introduce Jesus as a god in the manner of the classic literature. Okay? That, um, I put it this way, that many of the Gentile converts, uh, converts were from uh, the ba uh, pagan backgrounds, were familiar with the heroic epics and power to wield by the various gods in their childhood. The idea was to present Jesus in the same light. Right, but none of these really square with that Gnostic tradition. But uh, I did have some other uh, readings I, I, I uh, skipped out uh, that I put up here. So let me just go back, because this is how this gospel starts. Thomas the Israelite, tell unto you, even the brethren that are of Gentiles, to make known unto you the works of the child of our Lord Jesus Christ and his mighty deeds, even as uh, all that uh, he did, when he was born in the land, whereof beginning is thus. So we see that uh, the word mighty deeds is how they used it in, uh, in the classic literature too. The mighty deeds of the gods. Right? Uh, you can see that, that language there. And uh, Thomas certainly is not a, uh, an Israelite. And uh, this is uh, 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 another story. Let me just bring it in here. Uh, because it's, this gospel's not that big. See, the little child, when he was five years old, was playing at the ford of a brook. 
and he gathered together waters that flew in, uh, flooded into the pool, and he made them straight and clean and commanded them by his word. And having made soft clay, he fashioned thereof twelve sparrows. See, I want to tell you this one because this is the most famous one. As a matter of fact, it's, uh, it's quoted, it's not quoted, it's referred to in the Quran. So what Muhammad had were the false gospels, by the way, and this is one of them. So it was the Sabbath, and when he did these things, he made them. And there also were other little children there. So what had happened to continue the story was that uh, the children ran and told their parents that Jesus is working on the Sabbath. The parents came and complained to Joseph. And Joseph came to reprimand Jesus for working on the Sabbath. And Jesus went like that. And the birds, uh, the clay birds, the 12 sparrows, flew away. So Jesus was creation. Right? Okay. That's the idea. Now, let's take a look at the Proto-Evangelium of James. There's many things that we believe in our tradition that came down that are not in the Gospels. And we believe they came down by oral tradition. Now, at one point, oral tradition is eventually written down. When it's written, it's important that it's, it is written because when it is written, it stabilizes. Because oral tradition has a, a tendency to evolve and change and shift as it goes down through the centuries. But once it's written down, uh, then it's hard to change it. And, and the more it's written and repeated, uh, so when we look at uh, what we believe, what we know about the infancy of Jesus, about Mary and Mary's family, much of it is not in the canonical Gospels, but it's in the Proto-Evangelium of John. See, this is not considered a, her a heretical uh, scripture. This is considered folklore, oral tradition that was put down. Okay, so folklore, uh, the folkloristic gospel is about Mary, her parents, Joseph, and a perpetual virginity. Much of our understanding of the Holy Family outside the canonical scriptures come from this gospel and several others. There's other gospels that give us this that we, we just don't have the time to cover, but they're there. Uh, many of the events described in this gospel happened before events in the New Testament. So we talk about the birth of Mary, for example. All that's outside the New Testament and before the events in the New Testament. Its sources are Matthew and Luke. This one particular focuses on Mary. Okay. So the gospel begins and follows the tradition of Abraham and Sarah that desire a child. We also know that uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth desired to have a child. It's the same story there that happened to Sarah and Abraham, only that came after. The story of uh, Zechariah and John the Baptist's father, right? And Elizabeth came after uh, this here, uh, Mary's story. So Mary's parents also were in the situation. So they petitioned. You see, the name, here's where we learn the names of Mary's parents are Anna and Joachim, right? And uh, they're without child because Anna is barren. Mary's parents petition the Lord for a child, and to them is born Mary, who they consider the gift from God. Right. So when Mary is three years old, she's presented as a gift to the temple to be raised by the priests in the temple. Promised to the service of God, she would remain in perpetual virginity. That's where we get the tradition the Catholic tradition that Mary was always a virgin, whereas some Protestants would say, well, she was a virgin when Christ was born, but she had other sons. But we find out here that Joseph is a widower and has two sons, according to this gospel. Right? So when she was 12 years old, the chief priests sent for the widowers. See, when she was 12, they realized that she would uh, start you know, menstruating and they didn't want to defile, they called it defiling the temple. God forbid that this should happen to her. So they uh, called all the widowers. They told them, bring their staffs with them. And they came. And the last one, of course, they said, God will give us a sign. The last one was Joseph. And Joseph, from Joseph's staff, a dove flew out. And they said, this is the sign. You're in charge of Mary. Now, it doesn't say he's to be betrothed to Mary and to be married to Mary. 
he was kind of to be her, her care, uh, to keep her a, a perpetual virgin dedicated to God and care for her. That's what he should, he should do. Okay. okay. So Joseph has to leave Mary to go away to build homes, build houses somewhere outside of their, their home uh, country. And he does not return until she's 16. There's some years gone by there, right? From 12 to 16. But on his return, he finds Mary with child. All right. It's a big scandal to Joseph. Right? And he's shocked and decided to put Mary away quietly. See, those words are from the canonicals, right? When, when he saw Mary was uh, expecting, he said, I have to put her away quietly because he was an honorable man. But he uses the same words here, but it's a little different. It said that. But uh, he decided to put it away. But the chief priest finds out. And he condemns both of them. Oh, and there's a lot of uh, talk when you read it down. He says, how could you do this? You were raised in the temple. The angels fed you. And Joseph, how could you betray it? You secretly married her. And you were not supposed to do that. And it goes on and on and on. So they decide, both Mary and Joseph deny this. See? But according to this gospel, Mary forgot that an angel had come and told her. So she couldn't remember how this happened. You see? So, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not laughing, but it's, you know, this is, the folklore is this that they were trying to fill fill in. People were curious and they wanted to know more about Christ as a child. They made up some of these stories, but a lot of them came down. You know, any story even that's made up has bits and kernels of, of truth in them. And they just kind of elaborate and expand out from that truth. So uh, they had a thing where they said, well, we'll put you through an ordeal. Ordeal is the medieval practice of, uh, of various practices of, of doing things to people so that they would tell the truth, like dunking them under water until they couldn't breathe anymore. And if they died, then, they was, then that's what they deserved. But if they lived, well, it's a miracle. And Anyway, so they denied it and they put the, gave them an ordeal. The ordeal was they gave them something to drink that was supposed to make them sick. Sent them out into the wilderness. They come back a few days later. Both of them were not sick. So they said that's a sign they're telling the truth. Okay. So they sent them their ways. All right, well, uh, oops, oh boy. Uh, I just lost something there. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, let me look at a couple of verses here from this, uh, from this gospel because uh, it, it is very interesting. It's not shocking like the other. I mean, Christ is not going around killing people in this gospel. It is really uh, interesting. Let me just read a little to you to find out where all these traditions come down. There's just so many little uh, tidbits in here that, that we believe and take for granted. And some of it is kind of uh, uh, stretching the envelope by, by going outside because they're not canonical. And this is the reason they're not canonical. Right? The church saw these in the early church and they said this is apocrypha. Yeah. Okay. So now, uh, now a degree went out. Uh, from King Augustus, right? We know he was the emperor, but this one calls him a king. That all the inhabitants of Bethlehem in Judea should be enrolled. And Joseph said, I shall enroll my sons. But what shall I do with this child? Referring to Mary. How shall I enroll her? As my wife? I'm ashamed to do that. Or as my daughter? But all the children of Israel know that she's not my daughter. The day of the Lord will come and as uh, and I will do. In other words, God will make do. And he quietly uh, saddled the ass and uh, sat her up on it, and his sons led it. And Joseph followed. Uh, they drew upon uh, near the third milestone, and Joseph uh, Joseph heard a sound and saw her sad. Joseph turned around and saw her sad and said within himself, perhaps. That which is in her is, is uh, 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 painting her. And Joseph turned around and saw her laughing. And he said, Mary, why is it that I see your face at times laughing and at other times sad? And she said to him, Joseph, I see with my eyes two people, one weeping and lamenting and the other rejoicing and exulting. Then they came uh, half the... Uh, uh, half the way, and Mary said to him, Joseph, take me down from the ass, for the child within me presses me to come forth. And he took her down, and there said to her, Where shall I take you? 
uh, and hide your shame, for the place is desert. And he found the cave, and there he brought unto her, and left her in the cave of, uh, of his sons. And he went out to seek the Hebrew midwife, a Hebrew midwife in the region of Bethlehem. Now I, Joseph, was walking, and he goes on and he describes how everything stands still. I see birds flying, but they're not moving. I see people eating, but they're bringing food to their mouth, but they're not eating. So something is happening here, uh, miraculously, that the world has just stopped uh, still in its tracks. So he said, uh, look at that. And he found one who was coming down from the mountain and hill country, and he took her with him and said to the midwife, Mary is, my, is betrothed to me, but she conceived of the Holy Spirit and had, been brought, uh, and had been brought up in the temple of the Lord. And the midwife went with him. And when they went to the place, they saw, behold, the dark clouds uh, overshadowed the cave. And the midwife said, my soul is magnified. You, you'll notice there's a lot of things in here that come from other scriptures. It says, my soul has magnified, for my eyes have seen wonderful things, for salvation is born to Israel. And immediately the cloud disappeared, and a great light appeared, so that our eyes could not, uh, not bear it. A short time afterward, uh, the light withdrew, and the child appeared, and it went and took the breast of its mother Mary. Okay, I know we're just about at the end of our time, and I'll just give you the story. Uh, another woman enters and calls Salome, and the midwife says to her, great marvelous things have happened. A virgin has given birth, and this is the Savior. And Salome says, I won't believe it unless I test Mary. And she said, I have to put my fingers there to test if she's still a virgin. It's worded exactly as Thomas said. I won't believe Christ unless I put my fingers in there, you see. And anyway, um, uh, Salome's hand withers. And she cries to God, I've been a righteous woman. I've done all good things. Don't do this to me. And an angel appears and says, just touch the child. And she touched the child. And her hand was cured. So all of these stories, you know, uh, they, they sat, the scholars say they satisfied a desire among the people to know about uh, the little details. Now, there's, there's different versions and there's more Gospels about Mary. There's just too much uh, uh, to cover in, in these sec uh, sessions. But the, the lesson here is to know that uh, these uh, was part of the early Christian beliefs before things were culled down into the canonical teaching. The church had to work its way through these things. And that's we believe. How did it happen? How did the church come out with this, with the scriptures that we have today that I say in all the scripture courses I take here at Good Shepherd? I always say you just can't make these things up because things just fit into place so perfectly. And, and it's because of the Holy Spirit. I'll just leave it with that. Everything else is apocryphal for face God, false gospels. Okay. God bless you. Do they have any questions? Well, I hope you got something out of this. And uh, uh, next April, I've gonna, I'm going to do four lectures on the history of the papacy. Four lectures will cover the main events in the church history, and we'll cover the main and the important popes coming down. We'll break it up into four, four sections. Okay. So I look forward to that. I thank you very much for coming, staying with me uh, from these. And I see faces from, from the previous lectures. And uh, God bless you all. Have a Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year. Let's say a prayer to Mary. Okay, do you have, have a question? No, no. I'm not. Okay. All right. Let's say a prayer to, to the Blessed Mother who's had, we just celebrated the Immaculate Conception and this important time of year. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.